yo, sisters. <laughs> You're not out of the woods. We're going to get you up here sooner than later. <laughs> Golly, and Avery, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Avery. What a blessing. Goodness. Thank you so much for joining us as we celebrate the risen Lord. <laughs> wow. Uh, we look at the Word of God, the Bible, and its gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, not as a myth. We look at it as God's word to us to tell us about the greatest moment in history. The greatest moment in history. People thought it was when I was born. <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> the greatest moment when death was conquered. It's the greatest question that people have. What happens after this physical life? What happens when we die? And I put that in quotes. Jesus said this to a couple of girls who had lost their brother. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He didn't speak of a bunch of individual physical bodies at that moment, he was talking to these sisters who were grieving over the loss of their bro brother Lazarus. They were grieving. And we all know what it's like to physically lose a loved one. But Jesus said these profound words to all of us. Here's the question that every single one of us must answer. One of the ones he gave to Peter was this. Who do you say that I am? So the greatest question really for Jesus is not, well, is there a God? They weren't even dealing with that issue because atheism was not a thing back then. They weren't dealing with the issue as what is my purpose in life? That's a huge question. It's one of the great philosophical questions. What's my purpose? Why am I here? What's the meaning of life? Jesus answered or asked these fundamental questions. One to Peter, which says, who do you say I am? Right? I mean, it's not just a dating system that was based upon Jesus. It's not just a Christmas holiday or an Easter holiday that's based upon Jesus, right? When you think about a cross, the thing you think about is agony. Torture, bloodshed, what in the world had to happen that drove these people to kill this mere man, Jesus? They were constantly accusing him of blasphemy. Did you know that? In fact, Jesus said to Caiaphas, the high priest, after this, he said to Caiaphas, he says, you're going to see the Son of Man coming on the power and glory of God in the clouds. And Caiaphas, the Bible says that Caiaphas tore his clothes. He was the high priest, right? And he tore his clothes because he knew that Christ was referencing himself as the Ancient of Days, which is the Lord in the book of Daniel. He knew that. He tore his clothes and he says, what further need do we have of witnesses? This man has committed blasphemy. And so there came a point where they were granted this choice who gets to be set free? Jesus or this murderer, Barabbas? And they said, let Barabbas go. Kill Jesus. You see, most people don't read the Bible and they don't think about Jesus in those terms. Why was Jesus so offensive? He was offensive. I'll be honest. He said to the Pharisees, he said to them, and I believe it's in John chapter uh, 8 earlier, he says, if you do not believe that I am, you'll die in your sins. Oh, what an offensive thing to say to the most outwardly righteous people ever, the Pharisees. They're more righteous outwardly than you and I could ever be. They, they did dot all their I's and cross all their T's. And remember, Jesus says, your father is the devil. <laughs> 
Can you imagine if you had grown up all your life in this strict religion and you had performed it perfectly, outwardly speaking, and along comes this man and says, your father's the devil. <laughs> I mean, everybody would sit there and go, oh my gosh, this guy is blasphemous. Kill him. Put him to death. And so they did. So they spat upon him. They drove the spikes into his hands and his feet, and he put the crown of thorns on his head. And then while he was up there, another guy, you know, had the courtesy to take a spear and chuck it into his side, right? What is going on? The world has to deal with that question, and so do we. Who do men say that I am, Jesus said. Who do people say I am? But then he says this <laughs> to these beautiful women who lost their brother. He says, do you believe your brother will rise again? And Martha says, naturally, she says, sure, one day he's going to rise. And then Jesus says this, whoever believes in me, Though that person were dead, yet shall he live. Are you ready? Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And that is what we're going to read about today. The life that we have in Christ. That we are not dead right now. We are alive, the Bible says. Ephesians chapter 2 says, you who were dead in trespasses and sins, old covenant. The old covenant was a time period of death, blackness, darkness, tempest, wrath, judgment. Now we're in this New Testament of life, righteousness, joy, peace, and the kingdom of God. And Jesus said, the kingdom is within you. So it's a different kind of life than what Martha was expecting, you see? Jesus says, I am the resurrection. He says, I am the living waters. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you have me, you have it all, amen? amen. That's why the Bible says, are you ready? And man, I have to deal with this every day because I feels so incomplete all the time. I feel incomplete when I'm bitter. I feel incomplete when I'm lusting, when I'm greedy, when I'm filled with pride, when I'm given the birdie. Oh, sorry, did I say that? No. <laughs> no, I do. You, you, I know, somehow we think, oh, could a minister ever give the birdie? <laughs> you don't know ministers like I do. Ministers are often the best pretenders. We have to put on a show. We have to pretend that we're more godly than y'all. It's not true. Don't believe that for a second. The Bible says we're all ministers, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 6. We're all ministers. And the Bible says we all stumble in many ways. He doesn't make a difference. He doesn't say, you know, all those people in AA, they really stumbled. By the way, a little announcement. I just got invited today to speak at the AA meeting on April 9th in Colfax. It's a Tuesday, right after church. A couple, you know, I, they've come, I think, one time before and said, hey, would you be willing to come and speak at AA? I'm like, rock on. I'm dealing with it, too. Absolutely. I would love to. We're all dealing with stuff, and no one's stuff is worse than anyone else. And so Jesus came to cleanse us, not morally. He came to cleanse us in his eyes. If my moral behavior can save me, if I'm good enough, if my performance is that excellent to where God would say, good job, you were good enough, come on in. Jesus didn't need to die, think about it. If I can save myself, Jesus didn't need to die. 
That's why the Bible says, for by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And one of the chief culprits of boasting is found within Christianity. We boast so often of our good deeds as if we're superior, and we're not. Paul said, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Amen? Amen. There's no difference. And so when we come here, we're celebrating something. We're celebrating that Jesus died, but he didn't stay dead. The title of the message is, and they worshiped him. So let's get through this. It's beautiful. It's continuing what Linda read for us. Luke 24, verse 13. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. Mind you, this is the resurrection Sunday, right? And talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing Jesus. Okay, mind you, this is the Lord. This is the creator. Jesus himself came near. And went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. So they can't tell who it is. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Because the one who had been discipling them for three and a half years, who was their bestie. I don't say that irreverently. Jesus was their bestie. They could tell Jesus about their tirades, their anger, their immorality, their jealousy, their drunken escapades. They could tell Jesus about, oh man, I beat this guy to a pulp here, whatever. All of their gross deeds that we all have done, Jesus just sat there for three and a half years and loved them through it and was tender. They couldn't tell who it was. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him. (laughs) And I love this. Are you the only stranger? They don't know it's Jesus, right? Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place in these days? He asked them, what things? Right? And I wonder, you know, did he have his hands in his pockets? Because I think if he went like that, they might have been able to tell. So maybe he did. Maybe he has hands in his pockets. What things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God. And Jesus is going, "Mm -hmm. that's me, right? No, he's not saying that yet. But you know he's loving every minute of it. I love it. There's Jesus. He loves it. When we say great things about him, amen? Amen. That's why the psalmist said, I will declare what great things he's done for my soul. And yet I'm embarrassed to talk about Jesus in public. Mighty indeed in word before God and all the people. And how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be, what? Condemned to death and crucified him. Are we Christians on Easter and Christmas? This is a truth 365 days out of the year. Jesus was crucified. It was for a reason. It was not in vain. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. They wanted a physical conquering of Rome. Just like God said back when they were slaves to Egypt way back in the time of Moses. The Bible says he redeemed them out of Egypt. And so they're thinking, oh, when's he going to redeem us? When's he going to kick tail on Rome so that we are the victors, the military conquerors with our big King Jesus, white stallion Jesus? Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. No secret there. Women astound men all the time. In wonderful ways. 
They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us, mind you, they're still talking with Jesus, and they don't know who it is. And Jesus is like going, I, I, seriously, I, I, I just... You have to imagine, he's the Lord God Almighty who could read people's minds. The Bible says when he was talking to the Pharisees, he knew what they were thinking. <laughs> Isn't that great? I love it. And that's what's so beautiful about his love. He knows everything that we were thinking this morning before we got here. Anyone want to share? <laughs> right? You know, who wants to share every thought you had this morning? Easter Sunday, couples fighting as they're going out the door to go to church. <laughs> Get the kid, for heaven's sake. <laughs> you forgot. <laughs> they were at the tomb early. When they did not find his body there, they came back, told us that they had indeed seen the vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Scary. What, someone stole his body? I mean, holy cow. I don't know, what do they call that? Uh, isn't there a law against that? We like go and dig up graves? What is that called? Uh, I don't know. It's something bad. I think, you, I think you might get a misdemeanor or something, but they're, they're probably mortified. No pun intended. <laughs> I don't know how that came out. Then he said to them, he said to them, and I believe he said this with a, a tender spirit, oh, how foolish you are. And they're going, who's this stranger calling us fools? How slow of heart you are to believe all that the prophets declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer? These things, and then enter into his what? Say it with me. Glory. Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets. Remember, they still don't know who it is. And now what does he do? He goes straight to the Bible. And beginning, he interpreted to them the things about what? himself in the scriptures they came near the village in which they were going he walked ahead as if he were going on but they urged him strongly they still don't know it, who it is but they know wow this guy's really been encouraging us he's been telling us great things he told us that that this man jesus would die and that he would rise and they're excited and they're going man this stranger we want to hang with him they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it's almost evening, and the day is now early over, nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. Don't you know how glad they were? Gosh, what a cool guy. We were bummed. And he encouraged us. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed, broke it, gave it to them. Then what? Can you imagine how excited they were? And they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. Psych. What a bummer, right? Imagine just finding a good friend, or maybe like a boyfriend or a girlfriend, and you're like super, super tight, and then and, and she says, I really love you. See ya. <laughs> you know, your mouth would drop. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road? I would ask all of us the same question. Don't our hearts burn when we learn about this resurrection, when we learn about the fact that the Savior died for us, that we get to live in his presence forever with the creator of heaven and earth, that we're not guilty anymore, that we're forgiven, that we've been made alive in Christ Jesus. Our hearts burned within us while he was talking to us on the road. While he was what? Opening the scriptures to us. And my contention is this. If the Jesus we claim to worship opens the scriptures, then maybe all of us as ministers, his ministers, should begin opening the scriptures. Man, religious Christianity that's just a social agenda falls flat on its face. 
The only time when we're going to know what it means to love others as Christ loved us is to read about Christ's love, right? That kind of makes sense to me. How can I know how to love others? How can I know not to be cruel, not to be judgmental, not to be partial, not to look at some people as worse sinners than others? How can I know that unless I look at Jesus when the woman is caught in adultery and they're about to put her to death and he says, whoever's without sin, let him cast the first stone. Isn't that beautiful? That makes me breathe. That makes me able to breathe. Or maybe like the song, as all of heaven held its breath, whoa. Jesus doesn't condemn me. That's what he said to the adulterous woman. Where are your accusers? And she says, they, they've all gone away. And he said, what? Neither do I accuse you. And I don't want this to sound trite, but by Christ's sacrifice, he let us off the hook, amen? Amen. The same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed. And he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of bread. While they were talking about this, Jesus stood among them and said, peace be with you. Come on, Catholics. Right? Peace be with you. Where, where do we get that? You know, don't frown on the Catholics. Man, that's beautiful. I love it. But it's a different type of peace. Jesus said, the peace I give you, I give not as the world gives. It means we're at peace with God because of the sacrifice of Jesus. And now there's no division between race in Christ. He says, in Christ, you're all one. There's neither Jew, Greek, barbarian, Scythian, bond free, male nor female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. Talk about peace, amen. They were startled and terrified and thought they'd seen a ghost. He said to them, mom saw some ghosts while she was in the care facility. Anyway, <laughs> she saw some weird stuff. I mean, I won't go there, but it was just like, poor thing. I'm glad you're out. I am glad you're out. You know, I told Colfax, man, it was creepy in there. It was creepy. Because you're walking down these aisles of this place. And people yelling and screaming. And man, there was one, give me my kind. She was cussing up a storm. The other one, poor, bless her heart. She's like, help me, help me. Spock. No, she didn't say Spock. But she just kept saying, help me. And it was and then finally, they moved mom to another room. And so every day, man, I'm going to see my mom. And I'm just like, wow, we got to get you out of here. It was like one flew over the cuckoo's nest. It was. It was like, man, we got to get you out of here before they give you a full frontal lobotomy. <laughs> or put a full bottle in front of her. Anyway, I heard that somewhere. But they were startled. They thought they had seen a ghost. He said to them, why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my... And then there he did it. He took his hands out of his pockets, probably. Look at my hands and feet. See, it's I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet while in their joy they were what? You guys, is that you sometimes? You have the joy of the Lord, but you're like, Lord, are you real? Are you there? I'm scared. I'm scared going to lose someone, stare at I'm going to lose my marriage, lose a kid, lose my job, get found out. You ever think about that? Worried about getting found out? I don't know, maybe people who are just good boys and girls, they don't have to worry about that. But for those of us who are little rascals, we have to always worry about that. Am I going to get found out? I'm joyful, Lord. I know I'm forgiven. 
disbelieving, still wondering, he said to them, are you ready? <laughs> what a anticlimactic statement. You got something to eat? <laughs> Bros. They gave him a piece of broiled fish. He took it and ate it in their presence. I mean, you think he would have said something like, it's okay. No, he's just like, give me something to eat. I'm hungry. You know, been in that tomb for three days. Good grief. And the girls found me, and they didn't even cook me anything, and they're women, right? No offense, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. He said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was with you, that everything written about me in Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Christ fulfilled everything. Then what? He opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Do you ever sit there and read the Bible and go, man, I just got to get smart enough to understand this sucker, right? No, no, no. That's not how it works. You go to the scriptures and just before you open that thing up, that big old 1800, 2000 page book, Lord, I can't understand this. Help me. That's what I said when I was 13, man, reading Leviticus and Chronicles and all them funky Hebrew names. I'm like, what is this? What are all these sacrifices about? Killing bulls and high priests and candles and ordinances and all that stuff in the Old Testament. What's all that stuff about? Lord, help me. Help me. And now look at me. <laughs> I'm just a peasant minister. <laughs> And he said to them, thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and, praise the Lord, what? Read it with me. Rise from the dead on the third day and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And see, I'm sending upon you what my father promised. Stay here until in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. And that is the living waters of Christ. And that's what Jesus said when he said, the one who believes on me, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. This spoke he of the Holy Spirit, which had not yet been given because he had not yet been glorified. Well, the Holy Spirit's been given, amen? And Christ has come to indwell our hearts. And now we have this power. We're alive in him. We're cleansed in his eyes in spite of ourselves. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, lifting up his hands. He blessed them. Isn't that our Lord Jesus? Here they are doubting. Here they are sad, grief-stricken, just minds smitten with sorrow. And Jesus, I don't care what you're going through. I want to bless you with me, my presence. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And you think, oh, aren't they going to be super, super, super sad? He just did the same thing before he vanished and they were bummed. Well, now he vanishes, but he had done something before he vanished. He blessed them. And that's what he's done with us. That's why we know Jesus is real and that he's in our hearts. And they returned. They worshipped. What? What did they do? Wait, I thought the Bible said you're not supposed to have any other gods besides the Lord. Exodus chapter 20. You shall have no other gods before me. And here, if you look through the Gospels, every time they worship Jesus, guess what he does? He accepts it. Isn't that beautiful? He receives it. That's why Thomas said to Jesus in John chapter 20, verse 28, when Jesus showed him his hands and his feet after he had risen, Thomas said unto him, what? My Lord and my God. I just ask you today, do you worship Jesus as your Lord and your God? It really helps when you fall flat on your face as often as I do. Serious. I have to. You're my God. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with what? Great joy. That's what happens when we worship in the sorrows, in the struggles, 
in the losses, in the griefs, in the catastrophic face plants, in the relapses, in the relapses. And they were continually, look, and we'll finish up here, in the temple, blessing God. The Bible calls us in 2 Corinthians 6.16, you are the temple of the living God. That's why I don't want Christians to be just Christians on Christmas and Easter. Does everybody follow? Come join with us. Enjoy fellowship. Enjoy people who are not, Lord willing, going to gossip about you when you share your junk. Right? But rather they're going to go right there with you. Thank God for the living Christ who is in us. He's forgiven us and given us life everlasting. And he says, remember? Remember? He vanished out of their sight to the disciples for a little while. But now that his power and presence is in us, he says in Hebrews 13, and I'll leave you with this and we'll sing a wonderful song. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Amen.